Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a, a great honour for me to be here today, and I would like to thank the club for inviting me to address you this afternoon. As Jeff has said, it's a uh, historic day uh, in that uh, about uh, 90 minutes ago, uh, shares in British Airways stopped trading, so the uh, company uh, is um, now winding down to uh, look forward to tomorrow and the creation of a new company, the combination of British Airways and Iberia International Airlines Group. And uh, we start trading on the London and Spanish stock exchanges uh, from Monday morning. So it's uh, definitely a historic day for me and uh, I think a historic day for uh, BA as well. Um, the completion of this merger is the uh, pinnacle so far of the 12 year relationship between British Airways and Iberia. We've actually been working together for a significant amount of time and I'm delighted that uh, I get the opportunity to lead this new company as its first chief executive. Now unlike some recent mergers, the British Airways and Iberia merger will allow the two airlines to retain their individual brands and airline operations. Uh, we believe that by working together we can build on both airlines respective leadership and strength in their markets. Iberia in Latin America, British Airways in North America and Asia, and then the combined strength of BA in Europe and in Africa. And we can strengthen our position uh, by working much more closely together. And not only do we have complementary networks, but the merger enables us to plan future capacity by optimizing the network across our two hubs Madrid Baracas in Spain and London Heathrow in the UK to benefit both the airlines and our customers. And British Airways and Iberia have been working together on a joint business between London and Madrid. We've actually had a joint venture for over five years. And as you know, in October of last year, our transatlantic joint business with American Airlines was created. Uh, so this long history of working together makes us ideally placed to take advantage of future opportunities. The merger means that both airlines are better positioned to take part in the industry's move towards greater consolidation. We've seen a number of high profile mergers and acquisitions in recent times in the United States, Delta and Northwest, United and Continental, Southwest and Airtran, and in Europe we've had Air France and KLM several years ago, and Lufthansa has taken control of a number of other airlines in Europe, uh, including Swiss, Austrian Airlines, and uh, BMI. So International Airlines Group will be the third largest airline group in Europe, and as Jeff has said, the sixth largest airline group in the world based on revenue. However, we're not gonna rest on our laurels. IAG has been deliberately structured so that it can easily accommodate future growth through future mergers and acquisitions. We don't want to stand on the sidelines. We believe that our industry will benefit from further consolidation, and we want to play a leading role in the industry's consolidation. There are potential opportunities open to us right now, and there are even more in the future when the current regulatory restrictions outside of Europe are relaxed, as I believe they will be. And as a management team, we've discussed our future merger strategy and identified possible future partners. But it's important to stress that we're willing to be patient. We're not going to be driven by predetermined deadlines. We will be driven by making sure that the right airline joins IAG at the right time. Airlines joining IAG could retain their brand while gaining the advantages of synergies created by being part of a wider group. Our future vision is a multinational, multi-brand airline group similar to those in many consumer sectors. British Airways and Iberia are the first two brands and we look forward to welcoming other strong brands to our family in due course. The group will develop and implement a joint business plan and will deliver annual synergies of about $540 million by year five. And we've put in place a management team that has a strong track record of delivering cost efficiencies and implementing business change initiatives. And I'm very excited about leading the team. I've always held a view that mergers can be good for consumers. There will be enhanced benefits 
with a larger combined network for passengers and cargo. And with greater financial stability, we will be better able to invest in new customer products and services, such as aircraft, airport lounges, and enhanced website and IT functionality, all designed to enhance customer service. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in October last year, British Airways Nigeria launched, launched a transatlantic joint business with American Airlines. They say that everything comes to those who wait, and we finally received approval for the joint business from the US and EU regulatory authorities last summer, some 14 years after BA and AA first applied for it. And I think it's an interesting indication of the way the industry has changed in that when we first launched the initiative 14 years ago, it was to great fanfare here in New York at the Waldorf Astoria. The world's press were invited. Hundreds of photographers and TV cameras were present. And when we finally signed the agreement, and this is a true story, the agreement was signed on the hood of my car outside a pub in the middle of London in Mayfair, a lovely pub called the Punch Bowl. <laughs> the photographer was the driver of my car, and the only camera present was my Blackberry. So, you know, this industry has gone through significant change, and I think that just this demonstrates. Now, the revenue sharing business means that we can provide fantastic new benefits to our customers, and it also means that our alliance, the One World Alliance, can compete on a level playing field with Star and Sky Team alliances, as they have had antitrust immunity for several years. Our customers can now travel more easily on the three airlines combined network, which serves more than 400 destinations in 105 countries with around 5,200 daily departures. They have greater access to discounted fares, more convenient connections, and higher rewards for our most frequent flyers. And all three carriers have launched new routes across the Atlantic. From April this year, British Airways is launching flights from San Diego to Heathrow. American is launching services from JFK to Budapest and Chicago to Helsinki. And Iberia is launching flights from Los Angeles to Madrid and Miami to Barcelona. Combined schedules and selling means that we're able to operate routes that would not have been viable for us to operate individually. And connoisseurs of the BA route network may know that this is the third time that British Airways has launched flights from San Diego to London. And I think that serves to highlight the benefits of the joint business. This route did not deliver a profitable return for BA in isolation, but we are extremely confident that by working together with our colleagues, it will be viable for us. When we were competing against each other on the transatlantic, I'm sure that many of our customers were frustrated by the fact that our transatlantic flights left at broadly the same time. Now that we're working together, we can improve our schedules to provide more choice from the start of the summer season at the end of March. And the benefits will be seen at airports such as JFK, Chicago, and Miami, and at Heathrow. And you will see our flights more evenly spaced throughout the day at those key hub airports. And we've also got dedicated support teams at those hub airports, in addition to Madrid, to ensure that our customers transferring at these hubs will be able to do so smoothly. The partnership provides a one-stop shop for transatlantic travel, regardless of how you book, which of the airlines you fly, or where you want to transfer. And I'm delighted to report that customer feedback on the joint business has been very strong. Our customers love what they have seen so far and we're really delighted about that. Now it's impossible to talk about consolidation within the airline industry without making reference to the industry's gradual move towards liberalization. The trend towards less restrictive traffic agreements continues with a number of important open skies agreements being concluded in the past year and others currently being negotiated. The EU concluded the second stage open aviation area agreement with the US during uh, 2010 and also concluded similar agreements with Canada. It's also in the process of negotiating a comprehensive agreement with Brazil and in talks with Australia. And the US has struck an open skies deal with Japan and agreements have also recently been concluded with Brazil and Colombia. All of these developments are really welcome. However, we need to go a step further and push for a comprehensively liberal aviation market that is free of the anachronistic barriers 
preventing mergers and acquisitions across genuine national boundaries. Let us finally put an end to state aid, subsidies and protectionism. Making aviation subject to the interplay of normal economic forces in the same way as other global industries will drive out fragmentation and inefficiency, provide better choice and value for customers, and ensure a sustainable future for airlines. After decades of low or no profitability for global aviation under the traditional structures that we have suffered, it's surely time for a radical change. Now, on my last day as Chief Executive of British Airways, I'd like to give you an update on how the airline is doing in terms of its financial performance and on improving our services and products for our customers. Last autumn, our half-year results showed a return to profitability after two years of record losses. And while we're delighted to see revenue improving, what gives us particular pleasure, and indeed personally what gives me great pleasure, is that our focus on introducing permanent structural change to our cost base has enabled us to see significant benefit during the improving economic environment. We have agreed productivity changes across the airline with most, if not all, of our staff groups. And last November, we recruited cabin crew, flight attendants, on a brand new contract with new terms and conditions that brings us into line with the market. And we need to maintain our focus on keeping our controllable costs down on a permanent basis, something that is reinforced by the rise in the fuel prices over the last few months. If you can keep your own house in order, you are much better able to cope with external events that are outside of your control. We also recognize that we must keep ahead of our customers to ensure our customers keep coming back to us, or ahead of our competitors to ensure that these customers keep coming back to us. And to this end, we're investing heavily in our products and services. For example, we're spending about $160 million on fitting out our long-haul aircraft with a new first-class cabin, having completed a similar upgrade to our uh, world-leading Club World business class seats. And we're also rolling out new cabins in our World Traveller Economy Cabin and World Traveller Plus, our premium economy cabins, with new in-flight entertainment systems right across the fleet. We're also investing in new aircraft, and we've taken delivery last year of three new Boeing 777-300 EOR aircraft that have been really well received by our customers. And we've got three more to join the fleet in the year ahead. These aircraft have brand new cabins and in-flight entertainment systems. Our innovative all-business class service between JFK and London City using the a Airbus A318 in an all-business class configuration is well into its second year of operation. Customer feedback remains extremely positive. They love this service. The ease of traveling between the hearts of the two world's uh, top financial center centers has proved extremely popular and we're reviewing ways that we can expand this service. Our subsidiary airline, Open Skies, that offers a choice of business class beds and business class seats, is also a very popular choice for customers flying between Newark and Paris Orly. And last year, that airline also added flights to its network with new services from Washington Dulles to Paris. We at British Airways believe that it's important to encourage customers and encourage entrepreneurs and we're particularly proud of our support given to American entrepreneurs and small and medium-sized businesses during the uh, recent recession in order to help build beneficial relationships uh, abroad to support their business and strengthen economic growth both here in the US and in Europe. In 2009 we launched what we call our face-to-face -face program in the United States. And this provided small business owners with the opportunity to travel free of charge anywhere on BA's global network. The program has been hugely successful. And during 2010, we selected 250 further winners. And as well as receiving free tickets, they have been invited to attend a special British Airways Face of Opportunity conference here in New York next month, where they will receive advice from some of the world's leading business experts. We're also keen to encourage Americans to come to Britain for leisure as well as business and are committed to raising the profile in the UK, working with the UK government on a very 
uh, innovative initiative to promote tourism in the UK. And uh, those of you who have traveled there will know Britain's got many historic sites, beautiful countryside, cultural diversity, and next year, uh, Britain will be promoted on the global stage with events such as the Olympics and Paralympic Games, as well as a couple of royal weddings that uh, get a lot of interest. And we're looking forward to playing our part in this. And indeed, now that we're merging with uh, Spain, uh, I'd like to remind you that Spain has some fantastic historical sites and beautiful areas to visit and slightly warmer weather than the United Kingdom. So to conclude, today is history in the making for British Airways as it merges with Iberia. Our brands, our heritages, and our focus on customer innovation will remain as strong as ever as we move forward, as the combined businesses will be much stronger together. And I am confident the merger will keep both BA and Iberia at the very forefront of world aviation. Our transatlantic joint business with American and Iberia means that after 14 years of lobbying, our customers can finally reap the rewards that the three airlines can give to them by working together. Over the last five years, I've enjoyed my numerous visits here to the United States as Chief Executive of British Airways. And as the new Chief Executive of International Airlines Group, it's a much longer title, but uh, I'm really looking forward to my next visit. I would like to thank again Jeff and everybody at the club, at the Wings Club, for inviting me to address you here today. I'm really looking forward to your questions and hopefully I'll be in a position to answer all of them. Thank you very much. I think most people in this room will know that uh, we faced some uh, industrial action by our flight attendants during uh, 2010. Um, I have to be honest, uh, industrial action is, is always something that is best avoided, uh, but there are times when you've clearly got to take a stand and take a stand against uh, inefficiency and take a stand against unreasonable uh, trade union behaviour. And uh, 2010 uh, indeed was uh, a year for British Airways where we had to do just that. Uh, we've got fantastic flight attendants at BA. Uh, we employ, currently employ about 14,000 uh, flight attendants. Most of those are, are members of a trade union and uh, most of those uh, balloted in favour of participating in industrial action. Um, the ballot was actually uh, late 2009. Um, I'm pleased to say that uh, we managed to convince the majority of our cabin crew not to participate, despite the fact that many of them had balloted in favour, they didn't participate in industrial action. And out of the uh, almost 14,000 cabin crew that we have, uh, just under 5,000 took part in industrial action, 4,923 to be precise. Um, and one of the reasons that we were able to successfully keep the airline flying is that we called on uh, other people working in the airline to pull together in the interests of our customers and in the interests of the, the viability of British Airways and asked people to train as flight attendants to do a full flight attendant training course. And I'm delighted to say that many of our pilots, indeed hundreds of our pilots, uh, volunteered to do so. And hundreds of them actually served our customers as flight attendants during uh, 22 days of industrial action. Um, our customers loved that. They absolutely loved the fact that a captain with four big stripes on his uniform, and they flew as flight attendants wearing their pilot's uniform, uh, served them on board the aircraft. They saw that as real dedication on the part of, of British Airways. So um, I'm pleased that we were able to do that. I think it was a watershed moment in terms of the cultural change within British Airways. It's uh, driven fantastic change. And uh, the benefit that we've seen was not just measured in financial terms, but I think measured in uh, long-term support from our customers and from other people around the business. So in terms of capacity, one of the things that we can do is uh, we can fly bigger aircraft, uh, and that's a feature of Heathrow. It, the average size of aircraft, gauge of aircraft in Heathrow is the, uh, is the, the highest in Europe uh, and continuing to grow. Uh, we can and are shifting the balance of our operation there, doing more long-haul flying and less short-haul flying. Uh, and as you know, uh, you know short-haul aircraft uh, would typically operate in, in our environment in Heathrow about uh, three departures a, a day, three and a half departures a day. So that can fund 
three, three and a half long haul departures, which allows us to significantly increase capacity measured in ASKs or ASMs. Uh, but it uh, is going to be a, a challenge long term because there, there does come a tipping point where the feed that we required from our short haul network um, is suboptimal. So it's really disappointing uh, to see the government's position against the expansion of Heathrow, which I think are, uh, is a position that is uh, uh, founded on a belief that if you stop uh, expansion at Heathrow, you somehow solve global climate change, which is a complete nonsense. Um, the growth that would have gone into Heathrow is just going to go to other hub airports in Europe and indeed hub airports in the Middle East. And I, I think it's a terrible shame that the economic opportunity and growth that uh, would have uh, come to the UK will go to our competitors in other parts of Europe. And I'm convinced longer term that the government will uh, regret the decision that they have taken. Uh, but uh, in, in the short term, we will grow our business by uh, shifting more of our uh, operation towards long-haul flying, which is typically more profitable, as you know, and it is the area where there is most growth, uh, Asia in particular. So uh, disappointing, but uh, it doesn't represent a major uh, challenge to us. And when asked what I was going to do um, for a third runway after the government uh, declared that they weren't going to allow the runway to be built at Heathrow. I said the third runway for Heathrow is now going to be in Madrid. And that's one of the real advantages of the merger with Iberia in that we can now, uh, through the merged entity, access growth through our partner I Iberia over Madrid Baratus, where the government has invested in new runways and new terminal capacity because they value the economic contribution that uh, aviation uh, brings to the uh, Spanish economy and actually actively promote uh, more flying in the interest of their economic growth. What can you do to keep the existing ones plowed when it's, <laughs> I mean, as somebody who was stranded there just before Christmas? And given that Heathrow only has two runways, uh, trying to keep one runway open is, uh, in, in a situation like that is difficult, but we believe that it was going to be impossible to keep even one runway operating in the short term. So we, we took a, uh, at the time I think, a, a brave but calculated decision to announce that we were cancelling our flying for a period of about seven hours. And we announced early on the morning of the 18th that based on the weather forecast we were going to cancel flights between uh, 10 a.m. and uh, 1700. We came in for a lot of criticism. Um, and uh, you know you had reports saying that uh, everybody else is flying and only British Airways is affected by this weather. Uh, we took the decision based on our assessment as I said. The airport closed officially at 11.26 uh, but in the uh, 90 minutes between 10 o'clock and uh, or, uh, almost 90 minutes between 10 o'clock and the airport closing uh, only 20 aircraft departed. So the aircraft had actually started coming to a close at around 10 o'clock. And uh, we, we got this one right, we called it right. Sometimes we don't call it right, but we called it right. The, the, the big concern, however, was the uh, inability of the airport to get the runways open again. Um, and as we've seen in some airports, uh, you know, opening a runway is not the big challenge. It's opening the runway associated taxiways and parking stands for aircraft. And unfortunately, the airport failed to do that. Now, the weather conditions were somewhat unusual in that temperatures were fluctuating. Uh, and what we were seeing there was snow that hadn't been cleared was starting to melt and then freezing. So the problem they had was not clearing snow from taxiways and stands, it was actually clearing uh, ice. Um, and uh, it, it was a difficult uh, position for them. But to have you know, the biggest international airport, one of the biggest in the world, but certainly in Europe, close as a result of what you would describe as a light dusting of snow uh, was clearly unacceptable. I think there's a lot of learn. Uh, lessons to be learned from that and hopefully uh, we're not going to uh, encounter that sort of disruption going forward. We'd just like to know is there anything in particular that uh, you remember in, within making change that you would like to tell us uh, for our students? My own belief is that you've always got to be open to the idea of change. You've always in fact got to drive your business to look at how you change. How can you become more efficient? How can you do things in a better way? look around and say, is there somebody else doing this in a better way? And our industry is great for uh, innovators. And, and we shouldn't be too proud to say that we're copying the lead set by somebody else. Um, I, I think that's the, you know, the, the challenge that we have. We operate in an industry that is brutally competitive. Uh, we operate in an industry where new entrants do not respect the traditional rules, and they're right not to respect the traditional rules. Uh, because the 
only rule I think we should have in our industry is what do our customers want. And we should be driven by what they want and change to reflect their changing demands and their changing expectations. But uh, if you ever meet somebody in this industry who says that they're doing it as good as it can be done, uh, that it cannot be done any better, and that that's it, they've done all of the change that is necessary and all of the change that is possible, it's time to get uh, somebody to replace that person because there's always a better way, there's always a new way, there's always a different way. And there are always problems uh, presenting themselves that uh, won't go away if you ignore them. So the, the advice that I give to everybody is embrace change. Look at it as a positive. Uh, try not to fear it. Uh, always challenge yourself. Are we getting the best out of uh, the way we operate? Are we getting value for every cent that we spend? Are our customers seeing value for the activities that we're doing? And the reality of the traditional airline business that has been really challenged by the new entrants. You look at JetBlue and what Dave Barger has done. Challenge the old rules and do it in a different way. Doing it better, doing it in a way that the customers want, driving a new expectation from customer. So anybody who's afraid of change or doesn't like change, get out of this industry because to me, I think the most exciting thing about the airline industry is that we see change all, the, all of the time. And it's our ability to embrace that change and uh, introduce that change and affect change is uh, what makes the difference between people who will succeed in industry and the people who will disappear. The question was in, in relation to online sales and distribution through uh, GDSs and uh, the future. And, and I know there's a lot of debate going on in the US uh, on this issue at the moment. Um, and quite honestly, I think that was de a debate that was inevitable. Um, particularly when you look at the value chain in the industry, one area that has traditionally done very well and made quite a lot of profits is the distribution systems. So we've had a situation where um, airlines have been chronically unprofitable, structurally unprofitable, but other parts of the industry, other parts of the value chain have uh, continued to generate uh, quite healthy returns, and that's not sustainable. Um, personally, uh, I take the view that uh, there is always a role for uh, travel agents, tour management companies, travel management companies, distribution systems. Uh, at British Airways, we will always distribute our product not just through our uh, website BA.com, which is fantastic, but we will be, uh, for certainly the foreseeable future, continuing to distribute our product through the uh, traditional distribution lines as well, because our customers want that. And if our customers want it, if our customers uh, find that uh, the, uh, the way, best way for them to access uh, our inventory, well then we're gonna do it, because we will be driven by what they want. But as soon as our customers demand something different, or don't value the service that's provided, well then the pressure will come on us to do things in a different way. Uh, but I, I think there's uh, scope for having a, a productive relationship between airlines and the traditional distribution channels. Uh, I clearly believe there's scope for seeing some change in how we distribute our product as well. Um, and I'm pleased that we're having a you know, a good and what I would describe as a mature debate about it at the moment. Uh, so it's uh, going to be interesting to watch. Uh, it's uh, always fascinating to see these uh, arguments play out in public and I uh, have to say I'm, I'm taking great interest watching this one from a, a position of a, uh, a, a, an intelligent uh, observer based on what I know of the industry but uh, a really interested observer of what's happening as well. Willie, we'd like to give you this as a token of our appreciation and a remembrance for today. Thank you again. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much. Now, if you could